Now that we've defined vapor pressure, let's talk about how it depends on temperature. So the delta H of vaporization is the enthalpy. Remember, H stands for enthalpy. So delta H of vaporization is uh, the enthalpy required, the amount of energy required to move the molecule from the liquid phase into the gas phase. And I always use the analogy of launching the space shuttle. You know, you're trying to get this molecule from sort of an earthbound phase into the atmosphere. And that takes a pretty big amount of energy. Now, it turns out that delta H of vaporization is a function of the temperature. It actually changes as a function of temperature. And as you approach the boiling point of the chemical, this delta H of vaporization can increase pretty rapidly. But at temperatures that are closer or well below the boiling point, delta H of vaporization increases very slowly. And in fact, for the most part, you can consider it to be constant over the kind of temperatures that you and I would experience. You know, here on Earth, it's not that often we get well below zero degrees Celsius, and it's only in places like Saudi Arabia that you might routinely exceed 40 degrees Celsius. So over that very small temperature range of only about 40 degrees, you can assume that the delta H of vaporization is constant. So the equation uh, for, for uh, vapor pressure as a function of temperature is right here. The change in pressure over the change in temperature is equal to the existing vapor pressure times the delta H term divided by RT squared. And this is written as a differential equation. And so we'd like to integrate it um, from temperature one to temperature two and from pressure one to pressure two. And we can do that pretty simply if you remember your calculus over here. It's easy to do that as long as we assume that delta H is constant. That should be a delta. Delta H is constant. Uh, if, if it's not constant, then you got problems and the integration becomes more difficult. But if you assume that delta H is constant, you end up with this equation right here, which is called the Van't Hoff equation. And it just says that the change in pressure over the change in temperature is related to delta H, which is the delta H of vaporization in this, in this example. Um, that's true if the, so the compound is a liquid. And so you're going from liquid to the gas phase. If the compound is a solid, then it's delta H of sublimation, which is where you're going from the solid directly to the gas phase. So either way, this is the energy requir required to convert one mole of liquid or solid to the gas without changing the temperature, right? So the temperature is just staying constant. This is the amount of energy that we need to launch that space shuttle, to get that molecule out of the liquid phase and into the gas phase. Here's a plot of what this would look like. Okay, so this is natural log of vapor pressure here. And we just happen to be using units of millimeters of mercury. You could use any pressure units you want here. It doesn't really matter. And then you're plotting that versus 1 over T. And in order to get this to work out right, you have to have degrees Kelvin here. If you do it degrees Celsius, you start having negative values of you know, temperature in Celsius, like minus five degrees, and that screws everything up. So remember to always do this in, in Kelvin. So these units matter. The Kelvin units matter a lot. These units don't matter hardly at all. Um, and so, as I said in the previous slide, we're going to assume that delta V H of vaporization is constant over the temperature range that we care about. And that's why these lines on this plot are lines. They're linear. There's no curvature here, OK? And that is because we've assumed that delta H of vaporization is constant. And, and again, that's a, that's a fine assumption for the kinds of temperatures that we're working with. So here on this plot, remember, this is 1 over T. So if we go this direction, it's actually getting hotter, right? Because it's 1 over T. And if we go this direction, we're actually getting colder, right? Because this is, again, this is 1 over T. So up here, where it's cold, in this region, the compound is a solid. And over on the left here, where it's warm, the compound is a liquid. Uh, so here on the left, right here, we are going from the liquid to the gas phase. And so the delta H term that matters here is this delta H of vaporization. Over on the right side of this plot, where we're in the solid region, the delta H that matters is delta H of sublimation. And of course, delta H of sublimation is bigger than delta H of vaporization. Because delta H of vaporization is the energy required to take the chemical from the liquid and launch it into the gas phase. 
Delta H of sublimation is bigger because it's the it's the energy required to first melt the solid and then launch the chemical into the gas phase. So it's bigger. And consequently, the slope is steeper over here on the right side of the plot. That's another way of saying that the vapor pressure of the chemical drops off more steeply as a function of temperature than uh, when it's a solid than it does when it's a gas. And one of the ways that you can think about this that might be helpful is to think about the relative humidity that you counter in the summer versus in the winter. Uh, in the summer, you know, you, temperature increases, relative humidity increases, but it's not a huge difference. Whereas in the winter, once you get below the freezing point of water, when you're in the solid range of water, it takes the, the vapor pressure of the water drops off really dramatically. And so as it gets really cold in the winter, you know, maybe it gets down to 15 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which again is, you know, what is that, something like minus five degrees Celsius, the, the vapor pressure of the water drops off really rapidly, and that's why it's so dry. That's why there's so little humidity in the air in the winter, because you're in the solid range of water. It would take a ton of energy to get that water into the gas phase, and that energy is not, just not around. So once we know what the value of delta H of vaporization is, we can use it to predict vapor pressures of chemicals at various temperatures. So if you, for example, go to the back of your textbook and look at the appendix, you can look up the vapor pressure of a chemical at 25 degrees Celsius. But what if it's 15 degrees Celsius outside? You want to take that value at 25 degrees and translate it into a value at 15 degrees. So to do that, we use an equation of this form. This form. Uh, and so this equation is a generic equation that applies to any equilibrium constant, right? Capital K stands for equilibrium constant. Uh, so any equilibrium constant, you can determine its temperature. It's, you know, so let's say this is your value at 25 degrees Celsius, and you can determine the value of that equilibrium constant at any other temperature if you know the delta H of the process. And of course, these are the reciprocal temperatures, and these, again, have to be in degrees Kelvin, okay, you cannot use any other, um, any other units here. It must be in degrees Kelvin here or else everything goes crazy. Um, but you can use this type of equation to correct any equilibrium constant for temperature. And so when we talk about vapor pressure, we have a specific equation here for vapor pressure. Uh, we're now, again, this is the pressure at one temperature versus another. Here's your delta H of vaporization, and again, you're, you're multiplying that by the difference in the reciprocal temperatures. So this type of equation you're going to use over and over and over and over again. This particular equation applies when the compound is a liquid, right? If the compound was a solid, then instead of having um, the delta H of vaporization here, we would have delta H of sublimation. So this this, you can still use this same equation, just use a different delta H of vaporization, excuse me, a different delta H if you are uh, in the solid region versus the, the liquid region. So we go back to the similar plot that we showed in the previous slide um, where we have our natural log of vapor pressure versus 1 over T, okay? And what you see is that the delta H of vaporization is usually pretty large, right? I remember I, I used the analogy of launching the space shuttle, right? So the delta H of vaporization is a large value, and it takes a lot of energy to launch the chemical into the gas phase. Delta H to melt the solid is not that big. So if you're looking at delta H of sublimation as a whole, only about a quarter of it is due to the melting of the solid, delta H of melt, or that's also called delta H of fusion. And more like three quarters of it is due to the delta H of vaporization. Okay, so that's great, that's fine. What if we don't know what delta H of melting is? What, what if we can't figure out what delta H of fusion is? Well, what we could do is we could take this line for the liquid phase and we could just keep extrapolating it all the way down here. Again, these are hot temperatures, these are cold temperatures where we're a solid. But we could keep extrapolating the liquid line down into the region where it's a solid, and we could figure out the, the, the vapor pressure of the compound, what it would be if it was still a liquid down there. And it turns out that this hypothetical subcooled liquid turns out to be a really useful concept. 
because delta H of melt or delta H of fusion is very difficult to determine, whereas delta H of vaporization is actually pretty easy. Uh, and so frequently it's, it's very difficult to figure out what's going on on this part of the line here where the compound is a solid, but it's pretty simple to figure out what's going on here where the compound is a liquid. Um, so of course the hypothetical liquid solubility here is going to be greater than the hypothetical or the real uh, vapor pressure of the solid. Um, so, so this is always going to be greater, right? Vapor pressure of the liquid is always going to be greater than the vapor pressure of the solid. Uh, and, and the reason, you know, these numbers might look strange to you because it looks like 3 is greater than 2.75, but you have to remember this is minus log P. Don't ask me why they do that. That's the way they do it in your textbook. Um, and it, you know, makes sense to them, so they like it. It can be confusing. But remember, you're looking at the negative log of the vapor pressure here, and so that's why this is less negative and therefore a larger number than this. Okay, and so this idea of calculating the hypothetical subcooled liquid vapor pressure of a chemical is an important concept, and we're going to revisit it a couple of different times in the class, um, especially when we start talking about the solubility of compounds in water. So I just want to introduce that topic now. We're going to take a break here and change to a new um, topic and a new audio file.